Hello, everyone. My name is Ann McNiff, and I'm the Executive Director at the Chestnut Hill Community Association. Thank you all for participating um, along with the Chestnut Hill Conservancy. This is a um, series of Ask the Expert workshops that we have been partnering. Is this now our third year? I think so. Yeah, I think it's our third year. So um, we feel it's a great partnership and um, we're happy to bring some really interesting and informative um, workshops slash lectures slash Zoom meetings. We're all very adaptable uh, to the community on some very uh, interesting topics that have to do with uh, homes, historical or otherwise, have to do with landscaping, gardening, outdoors, lighting, a wide variety of topics. Um, so thank you very much. Just um, many of you, as I see your names, um, I know that uh, you are uh, community association members. And if you're not, please consider joining uh, as the stores on Germantown Avenue and in the surrounding areas open up. We hope that you'll enjoy your new uh, passport if you've renewed this year. and. Um, Please let us know if there's anything about it you like or you don't like. And, uh, you know, we um, hope to continue great relationships with our local businesses and, of course, with the Conservancy on this great program. So I'll turn it over to Lori now and she'll give us a little more information. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm Lori Salganikov with the uh, Chestnut Hill Conservancy. Um, and uh, we are as you all know, a different organization for the Chestnut Hill, from the Chestnut Hill Community Association, but glad to be in partnership with them on, thing, on the many ways that we overlap. Um, we are also a member organization and um, excited to have uh, you as uh, members. Tonight's lecture is about, um, is about uh, efficient, energy efficient lighting and is the first uh, mindful foray into the um, into the zone of sustainability that the conservancy has done in, in recent in recent days, and it's something that we're hoping to expand into. I saw a few people um, uh, on this call who are a part of the group who uh, were talking about. Uh, broadening our understanding of how to live more sustainably in our houses and on the land. And um, so and thank you for bringing us to this uh, this evening. And we're delighted to have Jerry DeSev talking to us about uh, LED lighting. And um, Leah, do you want to add anything? I'll just add if anybody has any questions uh, while, while Jerry is uh, <laughs> presenting, please, please uh, uh, write them in the chat box um, and uh, he, we may um, stop it at various points to answer questions, but when he's done as well, we'll kind of go back and uh, answer questions later. That's all. So, so Jerry, welcome. Thank you. Very glad to be here. So I'm Jerry DeSev. I am almost a lifelong resident of Chestnut Hill. I grew up here, actually right across the street on Graver's Lane from one of the folks who are here, Eileen Javers, uh, and her famous son, Eamon, and her less famous son, Quinn, who's not necessarily, maybe maybe just less famous to, to the national audience, but very famous locally in California where he lives now, but um, went and lived in a number of different places in Manhattan and down in Washington, D.C., and 14 years ago decided to move back to Chestnut Hill and found an amazing historic home to live in, and we've been very happy here for that whole period of time. And we have tried to do what Lori was just talking about, really maintain the home as a historic residence and at the same time do everything that we can to make it as sustainable as possible. And one of the things that I do professionally is I work in lighting and energy efficiency. Overall, I've been working in sustainability and energy efficiency for about 12 years. And a lot of that has been in working specifically with making buildings more efficient 
in terms of lighting and other systems, but lighting is what I focus on right now as a management consultant and I work for Pico specifically as a client and run a program that they have for energy efficient lighting in commercial buildings. Um, so my house is a real passion of mine, sustainability is a real passion and lighting is my profession. So this was a great nexus when the team here asked me to, to present, I jumped at the chance. Uh, I also used to teach at Philadelphia University with Alex and uh, who was your other uh, presenter the other week? Scott Kelly. Scott Kelly. Uh, so the three of us uh, used to teach at Philadelphia University at the same time in their sustainable masters of design program, which is in their architecture school. Um, so, a uh, little bit of overlap with them. And, and uh, when I was talking with the team, uh, specifically with Gene, about what, what I would present, uh, what I thought I'd do is just give you a quick tour of my home, show you some of the improvements that we've done in terms of sustainability and energy efficiency, and then give you uh, really just a quick rundown on how you can make your home more efficient in terms of using really practical lighting all over the place. So what you're looking at on screen is a detail of the plans for the home that I live in right now, which is on Meadowbrook Avenue, it is the garage and gardener's house for a really large house next door. Um, and we're very lucky because we're sited right next to the Arboretum. We can literally walk into the Arboretum whenever we want to uh, and tour around even after hours and come back. Uh, so not only is it a great home in a great neighborhood, but we also have that kind of amenity as well. Um, and so the home came with the original plans, which was pretty amazing. Uh, we have the actual blueprints that were built. And so I was going to use that for touring because it's actually a pretty difficult home to take pictures of. Uh, there are just a lot of different angles and a lot of things going on and you can't get the ideal angle that these great draftsmen had when they made these plans. So I thought I'd use that. If you're looking at the home from the street, you see this kind of small little boxy almost cottage, uh, which is uh, like the rest of the home in a Dutch colonial style. Um, but it doesn't, it doesn't look like much. You can't really tell what's going on, but this was where the gardener lived. The gardener was also the chauffeur and they figured, okay, we'll put his house right next to both a greenhouse as well as the car garage. Um, and then it'll be really easy for him to do all the things that he needs to do, basically like a live work kind of situation here. Um, this is where the cars were actually stored behind those large doors. And then on the left hand side, they'd originally planned on putting a greenhouse over there. Uh, so that's the greenhouse there. And it would have been glassed all over the roof section of that left part there. Um, and then really the living part of the house that we were just looking at was over here. So we were looking at it from this angle. Um, but you get a sense of kind of what the house really looks like and the style that it was built in. And a couple of years ago, I went to Holland and I thought, you know, Dutch revival was almost just a term or Dutch colonial revival was just a term. But you would see buildings in Amsterdam where it looked almost exactly like this. And we would go inside and sort of tell them what we were why we were so excited about the buildings and we would look at how they were constructed and, and inside they would be constructed in a really similar manner as well. So it's just fascinating to see that not only is it taking the exterior style, but really they took a lot of cues from the inside as well. Um, so it's a little hard to tell from this picture, but it's sort of a theme in these uh, where the house is built on a slope. And so up here, it's much higher then here and then even down here. So there's a there's a slope that runs pretty seriously down the whole thing, which makes being inside a little more dramatic. It's not just one level and then everything's kind of an open plan. It, it has all these little spaces and, and buildings um, almost put together while also running down the hill. So this is the back of the house. They call it the side elevation. I'm not quite sure why that is. Um, <clears throat> but this looks out onto the Arboretum. And then you can see this used to be the, the original plan was the greenhouse 
would have been here, glass not included. I don't know where the glass was going to come from, but that was the greenhouse for the gardener. And then one of the things that we have that are great are these little eyebrow dormers. Uh, and we've actually restored all of those so that they have the original kind of style that they would have with the copper flashing around them. Uh, when we got here, they had actually been just shingled over with cedar shingles. Uh, so it was neat to be able to bring those back. Uh, and then this really shows you how it runs down the hill. Uh, in, so this uh, faces Gates Hall, which is right next door to us, and uh, just gives you a sense of, of what the, the different pieces are as they come together on this side, where we've got the, the small living quarters, the garage that's over here, it's a bedroom up here, and then I'm actually, I'm standing literally right here right now. This is my office back here. Um, so, uh, that's just what the house kind of generally is, and we've tried to maintain it as, as best we can in terms of maintaining the exterior look as, as best we could. Um, and then what was great is in 1968, there was a guy who came along named John Milner, and John was fresh out of Yale Architecture School. Uh, people describe him as being in bell bottoms, which I thought is kind of funny because um, I don't think he'd ever wear bell bottoms again, but uh, that was what he looked like. And uh, he came and worked with the uh, owner of the house. And really, as part of his, his first work, uh, remade the whole house from that garage and gardener's cottage into a real single family home. Um, and what I think is really interesting is that was his first work. It was here in Chestnut Hill. And then he went on to do a whole portfolio of amazing projects in conservation, turning historic homes or, uh, or other places that has, had essentially been dilapidated into homes again, making them very modern, refreshing the inside. But all along the way, maintaining the original detail on the exterior and also on the interior. And what I think is is interesting when you look at his portfolio is how many homes are similar to ours. It's almost this theme that runs through a lot of his work that you see these same cedar shake roofs and, and the, the gabled roofs and these different little dormers in different places. Um, so it's kind of fascinating. It's almost like he, he has this sort of cinematic relationship with our house and, and it follows him around in these different places. And it's almost like a love affair. You know, how can I rekindle that first love by, by building these other buildings or working on these other homes? So, um, so it was great. It's, uh, it's been fascinating to learn that piece of the history. We didn't know that when we bought the house. We learned about John uh, a couple of years ago, and we actually talk with him and his team uh, whenever we're thinking about doing different projects that might be a, a little bit, uh, you know, a, a little more impactful on the original way that uh, John Milner had conceived of things and put things together and, and they help us understand like, you know, this, this is a good idea or this isn't a good idea. And one example is we really had to rebuild our chimneys and uh, we had someone from John Miller come and talk to us about doing that and she was fantastic. Uh, Mary, I believe her last name was Morosuko. Um, and uh, she just said, you know, don't do this wrong, really do this right. It's important to your house. And uh, that input was really invaluable. It helped us pick the right person to do the work and and they've done a great job and it looks even more original than it had before at the same time. So this is what our house looks like today. Um, this is um, the front of it looking from Meadowbrook Avenue. Those are my dogs. Those are our two field spaniels. That's Bjorn on the left and Bates on the right, Mr. Bates. Um, so you can see that this house not only looks like that last picture a lot, but also really hasn't been touched uh, with the exception really from this particular view of the wires and the, the storm windows that were put in, um, everything looks the same. And in a lot of the windows, actually the storms are on the inside of the windows to maintain the historic period look of the windows. Um, so up top, you can actually see this is post that, uh, that rebuilding of this particular chimney. You can see all the flashing there. Um, made the way that, that Mary said we should do it, and, and it looks fantastic. Here's one of the dormers that we redid. Back here, you can see the copper on top of that as well. So this is looking at where the garage had been over here, and this gives you much more of a sense of the kinds of details that 
Mr. Milner uh, maintained here, we have the original downspouts over here, uh, the original gutters. We have this beam over here that would have been used for raising hay up into here, and there was a hay loft in here um, that's right above where I sit right now. And then different things like this gas pump over here, which is just amazing. Excuse me, just a moment. Um, and the, the reason why it's so amazing is that the level of detail that, that went into this included just leaving the original almost, um, I guess this would have been the price card of the pump inside of the pump itself. They didn't take it out. Um, and I've never touched the inside of it either. I'm afraid that if I did, it would all completely fall apart. But you would actually, I guess, write in 1912 or 1914, whenever this was put in, uh, all of the prices. And then you, it says down in the bottom, mark in soft pencil and use uh, a soft eraser when you're erasing so that you can change the prices on it as they go up from you know a penny a gallon to two pennies a gallon or something like that. So that's kind of the quick tour of, of the house as John Milner worked on it. And then we got here in 2005 and we've been doing things uh, for the past 15 years here. And so we really took advantage of the facing and the siting of the house and the orientation that it had as a result in part of intending to be a greenhouse, even though it never ended up being that, ended up being stables, um, it's still sited perfectly for the sun to go over this whole face. So one of the things that we've done is put solar panels on the back of the house. And so when this was put together, it was actually the largest solar array, the largest residential solar array in the city of Philadelphia. Um, so it's pretty big. It definitely meets all of our needs. And then we actually sell power back to Pico on a regular basis. Um, and uh, from the street, as you might have seen in, in the other views, you don't notice that the panels are here. We really took care to make sure that that wasn't the case. And actually, this particular one right here was a little bit visible from the, the uh, courtyard that we have. And at one point, I had a cherry picker, and I went up there, and I, I nudged it over about four inches just to make sure that you couldn't see it anymore. So now you can't see any of this. Uh, but it supplies all the power that we need, uh, summer, winter. Um, and then we get a little bit of money back from Pico every year for uh, selling power to the grid that is 100% renewable. Um, so one of the things that we did when we put the solar panels on was we redid the roof there and at that point in time, and then anytime we've opened up the roof or gone into different places, we've added spray insulation to really seal up the outside. Uh, we've done that really carefully. It's important to do that carefully with historic homes so that you can have access to the wires, so that you can make sure, for example, that you don't ruin the breathability of the roof and the, the envelope of the home, um, which is, I mean, it's, it's really necessary for uh, things like just making sure that you don't grow mold uh, and you have clean air coming in as well. Um, so you do want a team who has the knowledge of that sort of uh, that sort of home before you hire them. Um, but our home is so much more snug and less drafty than it used to be, thanks to all the spray foam that's gone in. Um, and it's very affordable at the same time. They've, they've really brought the price down. And we upgraded to a really uh, energy efficient uh, heat pump system. What's great about it is that it does have a smart thermostat very similar to a Nest and also has an app on your phone. Uh, and so we're able to make it even more efficient because we can control it really wherever we are. Uh, if we're home, we can do it from inside the home without going over to the thermostat or if we're away and we forgot to turn something off, maybe we've gone to the, you know, to the mountains for the weekend or something like that, we can make changes remotely as well. Um, so very efficient unit. And then we also added a very efficient uh, furnace as well, uh, did all of that together. Our old system was on its last leg, so it needed to be replaced. And it really isn't that expensive to go to a more efficient option uh, when you're doing your, your furnace and your heat pump. So we also took advantage of the fact that we mainly uh, get free electricity uh, to install an electric hybrid water heater. So that's what you see here. We also put in an energy efficient Energy Star dryer 
and we switched it from a gas dryer to an electric dryer because we do have renewable energy here. Uh, it's definitely less of a carbon footprint to use electricity versus gas. Uh, and then we also replaced our gas range with one of these, which is an, an, an induction electric cooktop uh, and an electric oven. And uh, the induction technology is basically like a kind of magnet that actually heats up your pan through magnetism as opposed to heat. So it runs cooler. It doesn't actually uh, offset your air conditioning if you've got air conditioning in the space. It's not really hot to the touch. It's not like touching an open flame and does an amazing job of cooking food all at the same time. So it's almost a leap in technology uh, over uh, any of the other available kinds of cooking and, and stove options that we had. Um, and then we also try to do the right thing in terms of recycling. This is our compost uh, our compost bin, which is gigantic. There's probably about three or 400 pounds of compost in there. Uh, and it's a little hard to see, but right above here is also just a little bat home. Uh, we didn't have a lot of bats around here and we heard that the population was declining. So we decided to just put up a bat home make sure that we were friendly to the bats. And then this is the front of the house. Um, we do have lighting all over the place. These are these fantastic old sconces that are uh, facing our driveway. And so uh, you know, we light up the whole courtyard using the lamps here and, and these giant sconces, which works really well. I thought this picture was funny. I, I didn't remember that my nephew was here. Uh, when I was putting together the presentation, it was just funny to see that he had climbed up on the wall over here and, and hopped up and was in the picture. Uh, but here's the gas pump. You can see the gas pump over here. Uh, and we also, we used to, we used to really not be happy about birds in our house. Uh, and now we just let them pretty much do whatever they want. And there's a bird's nest here, there's a bird's nest over here, and then there's one also on the other side uh, facing this as well. So we just let nature kind of do what it wants. And they have not been harmful at all. It's, it's actually kind of nice because we always have birds flying around and singing outside. Uh, it just makes everything a little homier. Uh, and for these particular lights, one thing that we do for energy efficiency is that we have a time clock that's connected to them. Uh, this isn't our actual time clock. This is more of a kind of promo photo for the time clock. It looks pretty much exactly like this. Um, but if you have one of these and it's switched to the off position and you don't really know what it does, switch it on, see what lights up at night and uh, set it correctly to the right time. Um, and then, uh, Again, if it's not running, you can use these little tabs to actually set the on and off just by unscrewing them and putting them where you want to have the lights turn on and off. Uh, so it saves us a lot of energy. It also gives us a little extra security. Uh, every time I read the local, it seems like there are more and more car break-ins, especially lately. Um, so this is a good way to, to really prevent a little bit of theft while also lighting up the whole car yard so that nobody trips and falls. So those lights that are in that sconce when we got here really were no different from what Thomas Edison had installed uh, in his Menlo Park uh, factory and, and he had invented before that kind of the old filament classic lamps. Um, and knowing that there were other options out there, we uh, you know, got really interested in the opportunity to upgrade everything with LEDs. Um, and when I first started, learning about LEDs, I was really curious, like what's what's different, what's different from that filament and kind of the classic vacuum tube. Uh, and the biggest thing that's different is that each of these little yellow uh, squares that are here are the actual light emitting diodes, the LEDs that are in these lamps, and they can put a huge number of them on one of these little discs or really in any kind of shape that they need to connect them all together to essentially a little circuit and get light as a result of doing all of that. Um, and because the uh, technology is really compact, you can put it into a light bulb pretty easily. Uh, this is a little bit of an older one here, um, but just shows you kind of inside of a, an LED lamp what it actually looks like. You've got the plastic shell that diffuses the light. You've got the LED panel that's inside that's basically one of these discs with the lamps lit up. And then there's a circuit that really runs everything up for the lamp, makes sure that the power is coming through the way that it should. And then it goes into this housing and, and connects in. Um, 
so just kind of neat to to look inside and everything gets smaller and more expensive pretty much every year. It's almost like a, a computer in Moore's Law. Um, so the prices have been diving a lot. The quality has been going up. I think one of the problems that people had with LEDs in the very beginning was they, they didn't seem to work very well. Uh, they would fail quickly and that was because there was a lot of junk on the market. In the very beginning, they didn't know how to control them very well. So a lot of them were really very blue or very harsh light. Uh, in some cases, they would just be too bright. Uh, they would be kind of unexpectedly bright as a result of that temperature, just was was rough on the eyes. Um, and they smoothed all of that out. So things are much better than they used to be. And because it everything is essentially electronics in these little yellow chips, you can mimic any kind of existing bulb that you may have in your house. Uh, just the standard kind of classic uh, Edison lamp, uh, something that's more recessed that would be up in your ceiling, a flood lamp for putting outside, a globe if you've got a decorative lamp that you want to put that in, a candelabra for your chandelier, track lighting or other kinds of high intensity recess lighting, maybe for pointing at art uh, that looks like this track item here. And then what they now call the Edison vintage lamp, which is a very old timey looking lamp. Uh, these are really popular in kind of hipster restaurants and places like Fishtown where you can see inside and it, it looks high tech if you look really close a bit, if you're far away, it looks very old timey and classic. And then of course there are the classic fluorescent tubes, these linear four foot or six foot, uh, sometimes two foot lamps, uh, and they're just strips of LEDs inside of those as well. So it is Ask the Expert. I wanted to see if anybody had any questions so far before I got into the next section, which is much more about introducing this kind of technology in your home and, and how to go about that. Jean, it looks like you're about to ask a question. Oh, I was just checking. I realized I better check the chat box. <laughs> oh, gosh. Have people been chatting and asking questions? <laughs> There's nothing in it in it yet, but maybe you could, while well, you have this slide up, maybe you could um, repeat what you told me about sourcing lamps, um, both online and um, in person around sure. here. Sure. So Jean's question had been, where do you go to find the more difficult to find types of lamps. So that might be something like a candelabra or one of these vintage numbers. And there are a couple of different options. The one that I use the most, especially for small orders for my home is Amazon. It's pretty amazing if you use the right search there, what you can find in terms of different, really pretty untypical LED lamps. Um, so a lot of options are there and then if you are about to buy a lot, I would say maybe a couple of cases of lamps, you may wanna to go to one of the local lighting distributors. And they typically don't just work with residential customers, they typically work with contractors or other kinds of service professionals. Um, but you can just go to Colonial Lighting, Colonial Electric, Billows Electric, and go to the counter and, and buy by the case, just like the professionals do. So um, that's another option as well. There are places like Thousand Bulbs or bulbs.com online. Thousand Bulbs also has retail locations. Um, and there you can see things, uh, which is great. You can really kind of almost try before you buy uh, if you go to Thousand Bulbs. Um, it's just, a, just an interesting, almost all lighting kind of place that you can go to buy lamps. Any other questions? Oh, how about, um, maybe you're going to address this anyway, but um, getting the right color temperature in your lamps. That's coming up. Okay, good. All right, so the most common lamp that you're gonna have is gonna look like this. It's gonna look like the same one that Edison made back in 1880 and so, one thing that you can do, and this is something that I did and it's worked out really well, is actually get a case of these delivered from Amazon. 
and we'll talk a little bit about how to make sure that you get the right ones for your home. Um, but just generally, this is a great way to go. If you have a lot of incandescent or even the compact fluorescent, those curly lamps in your house, and you really want to get everything kind of reset and also to be as efficient as possible, you can go and buy one of these cases. I mentioned that there were some problems with LEDs. One of them was definitely the expense of them when they first came out that you would go to the store and a lamp would be 13 or $14 versus you know, finding the same sort of thing for maybe two or $3 in an incandescent. That's changed really dramatically. Uh, my case that I bought of these lamps cost almost $23, not even. Um, so pretty dramatic in terms of the way that the costs have come down and you have 24 of them, which is great. You have probably one for every lamp that you have and then a couple left over for replacing other uh, lamps or different things that you forgot about or maybe that burned out. Um, you do wanna be uh, you know, cost conscious about this, but the return is, is pretty incredible. Even if you don't buy these, um, you can use online calculators to figure out what your payback might be. But I did the payback calculations for these particular ones. And one of those bulbs costs 95 cents. It saves $5 a year and pays for itself in two months. And so it's something that really makes a lot of sense. If you get the whole case, then it's multiplying all of that times 24. You save $120 a year. And then these will last for 10 years. And so you're looking at saving maybe even $1,200. Uh, so it's, it's the right thing to do for the environment using less energy, but then it's the right thing to do financially if you can uh, to you know, put these in as many different places as you possibly can because they will save so much. The more you do, the more you'll save. So trying to figure out where to put things and, and doing the right thing at the same time is really important. You don't want to get the wrong look for your home or have something that doesn't look historic, uh, if that's the look that you're going for. So the first thing is, where is the lamp going? Is it an exterior or interior? Uh, these came with the house. These are just really not great lamps, um, but it's it's one of the examples of the exterior lamp uh, from our house. And so you do want to make sure that you've got something that's bright enough. You want to make sure that it's waterproof uh, and any other considerations that you might want to make uh, to get the kind of light to really, uh, if you're looking to secure the outside of your home or, or light it up, you know, just get the, the output that you're looking for. The other thing, and it's a little hard to tell here, but this plugs into a socket. I just disconnected it. We didn't need it on. Um, someday I'll just take the whole thing down all together because it's, it's pretty ugly. Um, but that's always an option. Uh, don't forget that you, if you have lamps, maybe you just want to not have lamps. Uh, maybe you don't need to light the area or uh, it just doesn't look very attractive or you'd like to save money. You know, it's, a, it's one out of maybe eight lamps in the area. Nobody ever sits near that particular lamp and you can just sort of unscrew it and save some money uh, just by doing that. So super easy thing to do. Um, so that's an exterior lamp. This is one of our interior lamps. This also came with the house. Um, someday we'll replace this as well. We just haven't found the right thing for this particular area. Uh, but this shows some of the uh, really small chandelier lamps with these tiny little bases. I unscrewed this one so you could see exactly how small the base was. Um, but I bought these on Amazon and these replaced ones that had more of that sort of flame tip and frost look to it, which I think were very popular in the 60s and 70s. Uh, this one looks a little more like a candle, which is what this is supposed to look like. Um, and so uh, we just decided to go in that direction as well. And then of course you have much more uh, area lighting uh, these are fixtures that we just installed in our new kitchen that we put in la uh, beginning last year and then ended this year. Um, and so uh, these are supposed to look kind of like a barn type fixture, but they do a great job of lighting up our whole kitchen. Uh, I put the LEDs from the case that I bought in here. Uh, so there are two of those in each of these. So this uh, is uh, 32 uh, watts of of power that's being used to light this whole space. Uh, so really not a lot. 
uh, less than a typical bulb that was an incandescent that would have gone into a lamp for doing reading or something like that. Uh, it gives great light. And then of course you have just standing lamps and other kinds of aerial lamps uh, that are more task oriented, maybe nearby you. Um, and those can also get the standard A lamp. That's what I've put in that particular one right there. Um, but uh, you know, you can you can look inside the lamp and make sure that you're actually putting in the right lamp just by uh, taking a close look at the lamp and, and getting the right replacement for it. Um, and because this is, uh, you know, the, the conservancy, it, it is important to also just try to think in terms of the character of your home, maintaining the character of your home. Um, and one of the ways that you can do that really is to try to use lighting to set a mood or a tone. Uh, Jean asked a little bit ago about the color temperature. I think that's one of the great ways to do it, not just the light output, but really what hue is the light uh, in the space. We try to get all of the same temperature lamps for everywhere so that the color is the same. So when you move room to room, it's not really jarring. Uh, so something else to think about. Uh, and that was one of the great things about getting the whole case is you didn't have to think about it every time you bought a new lamp. You had 24 and you knew that the temperature, uh, the, the look, that particular hue of the color was going to be the same in each of the different rooms. When you're thinking about doing replacements, you can use a chart like this. Uh, I basically just copied one that was online to put into the presentation. Um, but you can look at the wattage of your incandescent lamp, figure out what the LED equivalent of that might be. And really one of the ways that you can translate that is the lumens. Uh, the lumens really is a measurement of the light output of a particular lamp. And so even if you don't have that incandescent uh, lamp and what the wattage would have been for it, you can look at the lumens and sort of figure out, okay, you know, what might I need based on this kind of chart? Um, so if you're looking to reproduce a 75 watt lamp, you'd need around 1100 lumens, and then that would be something like nine to 13 watts in an LED. But this gives you also an idea of the savings that are possible from LED lamps themselves. You're really talking about a, a, about a sixth of the, the power, and so you're talking about a sixth of the cost. That's uh, pretty dramatic. Here's another look at color temperature. It goes on a scale from 2,700 kelvins, which is what the K stands for, to 5,000. And so 27 or 3,000, 2,700 K or 3,000 K uh, really is in the warmer kind of shade. Um, that's supposed to be relaxing. It's, it's a very good general light. It's nice for dinner time. Not always so great for reading. You do want something that's probably more like a neutral white, this 3500K, uh, really just, just to provide a little extra definition, especially if you've got aging eyes. Um, you know, it just it makes the text on a page or the pictures on a page sharper, easier to look at. Um, and so it's, it's, a nice, uh, it's a nice kind of intermediate. Daylight, this 5,000K option really isn't something that you want in your home. Uh, it's almost good to look at the package of what you're buying or look online at the listing and make sure that you're definitely not getting something at that end of the spectrum. Uh, really about, probably I would say about 3,700 is the cutoff for what would be comfortable in a residential home uh, and not make it really, really harsh. Uh, there may be some places where you do want that, maybe above your vanity for uh, mirror lighting, just to get a, a better look at you know how things are before you head out of the home. Um, but that's that's pretty unlikely. Um, a, a better way to go may just be to bump up the wattage to get a, a better view of what uh, you may look like instead of going to a harsher light that may not be uh, as flattering as you'd want it. So uh, we did look at this picture before, but it's worth referring back to when you're looking for lamps, you really do want to match exactly what you've got in a fixture or uh, in the ceiling directly by either maybe bringing it to a hardware store or a light uh, specialty store, having them take a look at it or by really carefully examining it. 
Um, and a lot of times there will be written on the top of the lamp or around the collar here, uh, some details about the lamp that talk about the wattage, talk about the color temperature and things like that. So you can actually read what you need based on what you already have. And then you just wanna do your search at Amazon or, or at your local store to connect uh, you know, to the right lamp for exactly what you're trying to match um, or improve. If you know that you wanna make an improvement in something like the light output or the color temperature, you know, this is your opportunity to do that brighten things up a little bit, change the temperature. Um, but it really is important. And it, it, it's a, it, it, it can sometimes be something that takes a, a try or two to get it right. Uh, I actually just bought some lights very similar to this track light here. And for whatever reason, they were about three eighths of an inch taller than the ones that I was replacing. And because of that, I couldn't put the cover back on. It just didn't fit anymore. So I've got to go get new ones. Um, there, there's always a little bit of experimentation that you need to get into, but when you get it right, it's great. It does make your home more livable, makes it more energy efficient, more sustainable all at the same time. Maybe also puts a little extra money in your pocket too. So uh, don't forget to think about the lamp type and what you want it to look like. And then the last thing is controls. When you're buying the lamp itself, you want to make sure that it is dimmable. If you're going to be connecting it to a dimmer, not all LEDs are dimmable. They'll really just shut down if they don't get the right voltage that they expect. Um, and if you are connecting it to a dimmer, make sure that your dimmer is capable of actually driving the LED light. Uh, Gina and I were talking before the call about how she has something in her home where that isn't the case. Uh, the old incandescent dimmers really are putting out a voltage uh, that uh, will drive an incandescent lamp, but won't drive an LED. And so when you dim it down, it just actually turns off, which isn't what you want. So um, make sure that your dimmer works with your, your lamp that you get. If it doesn't, you may need to update your dimmer a little bit too. And that's a job probably for a professional. Uh, if you do have somebody who's really handy and, and good at electricity, they can work on it. Otherwise, it's probably better or less left to a, a lighting contractor or electrical professional. And then timers have come a long way. They've gone from that kind of strange clock in a box that I have to something that's much more like a digital watch. It's easy to set um, and so and, and also fits uh, more in your home as opposed to being in uh, the basement where I've got mine. You could put this pretty much anywhere and have it look okay. Um, and it's easy to read, easy to set, and so uh, really encourages you to interact with it and, and make your home more efficient by setting the time for your lights when they'll go on and when they'll go off and scheduling all of that, almost like if you've got a modern thermostat you can do now for your heat and cooling. And then the last thing to think about is, is maybe just more accessible controls. Uh, this is something that I bought that plugs into the, uh, the outlet near where we have our lamps and then we plug our lamps into it and we can actually turn on and off three of the lamps in our living room really quickly and easily. Uh, so if you know anyone who may even have trouble getting up and turning lamps off, this is a great thing that they can use. Uh, or if you just want to have more control over your lamps, it's something that you can use just for yourself. Uh, we mainly do it just because if we leave all the lamps on, if we've been reading and then start watching TV, there's just a lot of glare on the TV. So it makes it quick and easy just to be able to turn everything off for ourselves. Uh, and this whole setup between the control that you see here, this little remote control, and then what plugs into the wall was $13 on Amazon. So just a nice little lifestyle upgrade. Uh, installs very easily. There are no wires or pliers. It just clicks right into the, to the, the, uh, the socket that you've got. So that is the main part of my presentation. And then I just wanted to let folks know, because it seems like you're the right audience for this, uh, where you can go to maybe get drawings of your own home. Uh, the ones that I showed you earlier, we actually uh, have some of the originals, but we also went down to the Antheneum in Center City and had a scan done of the originals as well uh, that we didn't have at home. 
And I was really surprised when I was doing a search for uh, just different things when getting prepared for this particular presentation, that there were, it seems, new drawings that they'd found and scanned in at the Antheneum, but then potentially at other places as well. And it's all collected here at philadelphiabuildings.org. Maybe everybody knows about this. If you don't, it's pretty neat. You can you can look at, at your house and, and your address and see if there are any drawings for it. Uh, and then if you become a member, you can actually download the drawings themselves. Uh, and I can't say enough good things about the Antheneum. It was amazing to be able to go down there and look at all of the things that they had and have them scan it in. I think it was about $50 uh, to have them scan in three sheets that they did for us and uh, then give us digital copies and prints back when they did it. Uh, it was, I mean, it, it almost was something that seemed like they would lose money on. So, uh, and they were wonderful people at the same time. It's just a neat place to go and, and check out if you've never been there. If you can't make it down there or you don't know what might be out there, it looks like Philadelphia Buildings could be a great place to go. Jerry, there's nothing, um, no, nothing new in the chat box. You answered the dimming question. <laughs> okay, great. Um, I just have one little question about, um, we have some, a few old halogen, you know, table or standing lamps. Mm -hmm. Are there equivalents for those? In there LA? are, yes. Okay. okay. And that's a great thing to do because those can get really, really hot. That was actually what I was replacing when I was talking about the one that didn't quite fit. Uh, the real reason why I was replacing that was because the switch is really close to the lamp for me. And I've, I've almost burned myself a couple of times now just trying to turn it off. And I finally said, well, why don't I get rid of these? They're 50 watts. They're really hot. I can get just a nine watt replacement for it as an LED that won't be at all hot. Uh, so it's kind of a, a, an upgrade and prevented an injury at the same time. Great. Carrie, I have a question about your house. Um, so the, what used to be the greenhouse, um, well, it was going to be a greenhouse with the glass, if, if the glass was ever provided. Um, <laughs> um, I'm assuming there's, that's no longer glass. So I'm just wondering, was it, difficult to light that at all as it would have been designed to be, you know, totally open? It, it has been a real challenge. It's funny that you mentioned that. Um, so when we got here, there were really unattractive, what they call shoe boxes, which look just like that. They're, they're just metal housings that are in a rectangular boxy shape um, that cast light directly down. Um, and uh, just we're not doing a great job and weren't very good looking. So one of the things that we did do that, you know, was, was a little different than uh, when we showed up was just to have different fixtures that went there. Um, and to try to, because it, the home is very broken up and, and has all these different levels and different rooms, one of the things that we've been trying to do is just put in unifying elements in the different rooms. And one of the things that we chose to use was that same fixture that you saw in my kitchen in that particular area. So we replaced all of those shoe boxes with the fixtures that look much more like something that you would find in a barn um, and put those there. And we also put them in a small kitchen that we put here uh, when my mother-in-law came to live with us. Uh, so it's something that now you see in those different places and it doesn't look quite as jarring when you move from room to room. So it's been a challenge to to light it mm -hmm. um, for sure, and we've we've done a good job. But it, the the room also sort of changes its nature a lot. It's a it's a very big open space. Uh, when we got here, it was actually a movie theater. Uh, the the house uh, had been redone by Ralph Hirschhorn, uh, you know, sort of local bon vivant and and insurance executive, um, <laughs> and so he uh, was the one who put in the movie theater there. Uh, he had the Yale Film Club come and, and watch movies on a big screen. Uh, so it was, it was pretty dramatic to walk into the space looking like that. 
Um, but you can imagine, given that definition, that like lighting is really something that would have been discouraged or mm -hmm. an afterthought, uh, which was why that they had everything just pointing down really at the walls, I think mainly so that people didn't trip uh, and bump into things. Apparently, the Yale Film Club uh, was, was also a bit of a drinking club. Uh, and so lighting in those areas would have been really important so that you didn't have people bouncing off the walls. He also put in a ramp between the small kitchen and the theater space so that people didn't stumble up the stairs. They could just have a smooth transition. Um, I have another question if any, I don't know if anybody else has some, I don't want to take them all, but um, I've heard that when Edison first um, invented the light bulb or the early light bulbs were actually they lasted a really long time, but that it was quickly discovered that that is a terrible business model and therefore the design was altered so they would blow out. Is there, have you ever heard that? Is there any truth to that? It, it is true. And it's really funny that you mentioned that. So the large lamps that are outside that are facing the courtyard, those big sconces, the large black sconces, they, they had lamps in them and we couldn't figure out what they were and they they didn't really ever burn out um, and I was a lighting professional I worked with lighting professionals I ended up bringing it in and having folks take a look at it and they were traffic signal lamps that they had put in particularly so that they could cast a lot of light and also be long life and if you put in much more filament you get longer life. Basically, the lamp, when it burns, just uses some of the filament every second that it's on. And the more filament you have, the longer it will be around. But if you can't replace them, just like you said, uh, it just isn't a great business model. But these particular ones probably cost a bunch of money, mm -hmm. um, but were extremely long life. Um, so yes, that's definitely true. Um, and it's something that I think was difficult for folks who were in the lighting business really to get into with LEDs. Uh, they knew that that innovation was coming and that it was going to last a really long time and light things just as well as an incandescent. Um, and so there was just a ton of upheaval in the whole market. Um, and at the same time, really a lot of the manufacturing went to China where there just isn't as big an installed base of existing lighting. Um, and they almost did a generation leap forward into the new, more efficient lighting with the LEDs. Um, so, you know, the, all the industry now is there and, and none of the incandescent industry is here anymore. It's just all out of business. Interesting. Thank you, Jerry. You're welcome. Do we have any additional questions? Well, I'm inspired to go replace everything. Do you have a question? <laughs> okay. Perfect. I think the, uh, the 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 most valuable lesson I learned was about the dimmer. So, to <clears throat> do a little count of dimmers and see if see if we can get an electrician to do everything at once. <laughs> yeah. Actually, okay, so I have a question about circuiting. Since they use so much less energy, can you put more of them on an individual circuit? You can. Like cutting mm -hmm. the amount of circuits you need in your panels. Yes. Oh. That's good to know. A question had come in, Jean, did you see that? Um, well, there was a question earlier about, oh, let me, I didn't see this one. About oh, great. the okay. compact fluorescence. Yeah, compact fluorescence uh, can be replaced, right? For sure. Yes. Mm -hmm. Or are they, or, or I guess is, um, are LEDs now considered better to be using than compact, compact fluorescence? I, I think so. Um, for the energy efficiency program that I run for PICO, we don't even provide incentives for compact fluorescence anymore. It really is all the LEDs. They're becoming harder and harder to find, the CFLs, um, and really just generally are not as good a product. Uh, the the negative thing that I find about them is that you do need to be careful about throwing them away. Uh, and this is something that should be considered in terms of sustainability and lighting when you are 
making changes to your home is the life cycle of the lamps that you're taking out is really important. CFLs need to be taken to some place uh, where they can be specially handled and recycled correctly because they do have a little bit of mercury inside of them and other heavy metals that could come out and just leach into the water or other parts of the environment. You definitely don't want that to happen. Um, and then a lot of local electricians will recycle those lamps or those long tubes, the four foot tubes that a lot of people may have, especially in your basement, maybe in like a rec room kind of area. Um, and it's important to do that as well. It's just better for the environment because they can, they can actually be recycled. Uh, and then there may be some components, especially in the older ones that need special handling as well so that they don't leak into the landfill. And ballasts are the same way. So these new LEDs are self-ballasted. They don't have those. There's a lot of times if you uh, have looked inside a, a fixture closely, there's something that's basically the size and shape of a brick that has some writing on it. And that's the ballast. That's what used to actually provide the clean and, and even power for light bulbs for those, those long tubes. Um, and those need special handling as well. Those a lot of times, especially if they're older, they come from a historic home, uh, may have PCBs in them. Again, something that you don't want getting in the environment. Um, so sustainably handling those is, is a really good thing to do as well. And uh, we have a general question about any thoughts on knob and tube since we still have to deal with that. <laughs> I don't know if you had to deal with that when you bought your house. No, we got lucky. There's some of it that is around, but it doesn't seem like it's in use. Um, lighting, uh, it really, it, it, it's, it's a separate discipline from electricity and electrical contracting and things like that. So I don't want to steer you in the wrong direction. Uh, I will say that, that there, there's a whole new generation of electrical code here in the city of Philadelphia for residential homes. Um, and it, it's a very different kind of structure, uh, particularly for wall outlets and things like that, uh, than you may be used to. And it ties back into the breaker panel, the breaker and, and the wall outlets all need to be what's known as an arc fault system now. Um, so different from what we have. And really the intent there is to prevent one of the outlets just from spontaneously creating a, a complete circuit and then potentially starting a fire uh, within the box or with something nearby. And so what the new system does is detects that and make sure that it doesn't happen. Uh, or if it does, it immediately shuts everything down so that the arc doesn't actually take place. Um, so uh, that gives you an idea of, of how far away from knob and tube we really are. Um, so, you know, if, if you do have that and you can afford to make the upgrade, it's probably a really safe choice. Um, and you'll be able to go right to the latest generation of technology, which is really the code here in Philadelphia now. Yeah, I, there was a, an Ask the Experts presentation that um, discussed knob and tube. I, I myself missed it, but um, Leah, was that um, McGettigan? Um, no, well, yeah. he, he did go into it a bit. He also talked about, and now I'm totally blanking on the technical term. Um, it was a later uh, technology of this metal tubing that went around the wires. Um, that's um, also in a lot of homes. Not Romex. Uh, yeah. No, before. BMX? Isn't it BMX or Oh, something? yes. That's, um, that's, yes. Thank you, Anne. Um, which is equally dangerous for various other reasons. I, I, it, was, it was very interesting. Um, he, he, in fact, was less concerned with the knob and tube, but, um, but generally, the, I think the greater point was it's all potentially dangerous if not maintained and also um, critters can get in and, and chew around and uh, the wires and expose things. Yeah. Wiring has come a long way since knob and tube. Um, and then here's an, here's an easier question maybe. <laughs> um, are all of your appliances electric? They are. We don't have any gas appliances any longer. I'm sorry, with the exception of our furnaces, 
which are really a backup for a heat pump. They only turn on if it's colder than 40 degrees outside. That's when the heat pumps start, stop being efficient. Uh, and so you really want a different kind of fuel. I'm sorry, what was the temperature point at which you said they stopped being efficient? 40 degrees. 40, okay. Okay, but, but uh, it has improved since like 20 years ago, right? Uh, the efficiency of heat pumps? Yeah. Yes, for sure. Is that, Jerry, is that just as a kind of across the board or is that specific to your house and the architecture of your house and the size of the rooms? No, he, he, the way that heat pumps work, they really draw whatever heat is in the air out of it and work with that in order to provide the level of comfort that you're looking for. And if there isn't enough heat in the air to make that happen, mm -hmm. they're going to stop being efficient and actually begin costing quite a bit of money. And it's not the end of the world. It, we we have fewer and fewer days, unfortunately, that are really cold. And so a heat pump makes more and more sense every year. Um, and we rarely run our gas furnaces. Uh, it's 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 pretty it's pretty rare that we do that. So if you do have a heat pump, it, like I said, it's not the end of the world, especially because they are very expensive to replace. You could easily spend seventy five hundred dollars or or twelve thousand dollars, you know, on a new system installed. Okay. Um, I think we're, we're at, at just about seven o'clock. So unless anyone has another question, we should probably wrap it up. And um, I don't know if anyone's in my neighborhood, but I'm, we're hearing a some sort of parade of drums right now. So. Oh. oh, it we might be our the... friend, uh, positive movement. Yeah. Yeah. With Elmo. The okay. Elmo. Go check it out. Okay. You should go um, check it out. A little distracting. <laughs> yeah, I imagine. <laughs> With the windows open. Well, um, Jerry, thank you so much. That was really very interesting. And um, there was a lot more in that than I than I realized was going to be. So it was very generous of you to describe the your whole approach to um, how you're how you're outfitting and and all, um, up, updating your home in such a sensitive way. Um, so thank you so much for doing that. And I do want to mention that if you buy from Amazon, you can buy from smile.amazon.com and choose your favorite nonprofit in Chestnut Hill um, to uh, be a recipient of Amazon, uh, of a percentage of that from Amazon. Um, so we are unfortunately named the Chestnut Hill Historical Society there, but we are findable. Um, so if you do outfit your house in an energy efficient way through Amazon, you can also support the community while you're doing it. Thank you, Lori. I just also want to mention that we have um, next week, next Thursday is our next uh, ask the experts, which is rescheduled from about two weeks ago, which is going to be about the uh, stormwater management uh, and featuring the rain garden that the water department uh, installed on Norwood Avenue. So that's next a week from tomorrow. That's great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And uh, Leah, this will be available on our YouTube page? It will be available on our YouTube page in a few days. Um, and if anybody missed it, last week's uh, program is already up on our YouTube page. Oh, great. Thank you. Thank you all for coming or, or tuning in, I guess, is probably, mm -hmm. or clicking the link. We appreciate uh, your interest. And uh, this is really informative. And I, I'm going to copy Jean and turn up, uh, go look at all my light bulbs and see what we can replace. <laughs> well, have a good night, everyone. <laughs>